Hey, if you would turn with me and your Bibles to Romans chapter 7. We're going to be reading from Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Romans 7, 1 through 6. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to one another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Thank you, Courtney. Today we continue in our study of the book of Romans, and I want to start by asking a question, and that question is, to whom do you belong? Now, some of you might be thinking, well, I belong to my spouse, or I belong to my parents, or I belong to this particular club, or, or whatever, but the answer to this question is extremely important, and a great way to illustrate what I'm talking about is I want you to picture a married couple who say that they love one another. But for the husband, he's always out with his friends. And for the wife, she's always out with her friends. And they're just not spending much time together. They're going out out of town all the time, and they aren't acknowledging one another. They make little effort to be together. They're not eating together. And in response to that, you may say that that doesn't make sense. How can you claim to love someone, to be committed to someone, if you're not spending any time with them? If you're going through life and acting like they don't even exist. If I were to ask you about this couple's relationship, you would say that for this couple, there is something seriously wrong. Why? because they belong to one another. And their relationship to one another then affects how they should live and what they should do. And the lives they are living don't line up with who they supposedly belong to. And so for many of us here, I think that we often forget who it is that we belong to. And I believe that in our passage today, Paul is going to address this very thing. He's going to do this by looking at the law. And so I want us to remember that this passage is absolutely for us, but it wasn't written directly to us. For those that Paul is writing directly to, for many of them, especially the Jews, the law is really important. And so Paul speaks to rightly orient what the believer's relationship to the law is. And so to best understand this, I think it's important that we recap kind of where we are in Romans, and I want to help you feel what the reader's of this passage would be feeling when Paul wrote this. And so remember that the occasion or the reason for the book of Romans is due to the disunity that exists between the Jews and the Gentiles. The fellowship and the union that should be there is just not there. So Romans is just a massive work for Jewish Gentile unity. And Paul is writing to address this and he sets out from the beginning of the book to just level the playing field, and he accomplishes this simply by preaching the gospel. He reminds his readers that regardless of who you are, and in the midst of the bickering and the desire to consistently one-up one another, he's saying, all of you are a part of one new family. 
You are all sinners, and you all deserve death because of it. It doesn't matter if you've been circumcised. It doesn't matter what dietary laws you observe. These things won't save you and won't ultimately change your standing before the Lord. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Here Paul is clearly stating the problem, that we fall short. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. But through our faith in Jesus and in Jesus alone, may we be justified. And our justification gives us a new status, that we are now right with God and forgiven. And we, we saw this in Romans chapter 5, verses 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the implications of this now are that everyone believing and putting their faith in Jesus Christ now belongs to one new family. And as Paul goes on writing, he's writing on the things that are going to at times be really difficult to wrestle with. And at the end of chapter 5, he writes, where sin increased, grace abounded. He then anticipates the question, That would be brought up because of this statement. And he answers that in chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. And if you've been with us for the past two weeks, John has walked us through chapter 6. Where we see that we don't continue in sin. Because we have died to sin and been raised to new life. Sin is no longer our master. And we are no longer a slave to sin. And then we come to chapter 7, and here Paul is explaining the believer's relationship to the law. And so real quick, there are times when Paul uses the law to refer to the Torah or the first five books of the Bible. I don't believe that's what he's doing here. What I believe is that Paul is referring to the Mosaic law. And by the Mosaic law, this means all uh, the Ten Commandments and all 613 commandments that we find in the Old Testament. And in our passage today... He's writing that we have died to the law. But for many reading Paul's letter for the first time, they would have really struggled with this because they would have known the importance of the law. So I want to spend a few moments looking at what does the Old Testament say about the law. And in doing so, I want you to really feel the tension that many would have felt reading Paul's letter. So I'm going to be looking at several passages, and if you want to turn there, that's fine. If not, I will read them, and you can just listen, so whatever works best for you. But I want to first look at Deuteronomy 6, and starting in verse 6, just to give some context, this is written right after we read the Ten Commandments, and here's what it says. This is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in the house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Later on in Deuteronomy, we read in chapter 7 and verse 26, just a few pages later. This is what we read. Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them, and all the people shall say amen. So we see here that to obey the law was to be blessed, and to disobey it was to be cursed. And this is certainly certainly what the psalmist had in mind in Psalm 19. And in verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward." And now later in Psalm 119, we see many things regarding the law. Starting right in verse 1. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. 
who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. In verse 70, we read, I delight in your law. In verse 72, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Verse 97, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. And now if we look at the very last book in our order of the Old Testament, in Malachi chapter 4. And in Malachi chapter 4, verse 4, it reads, Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statues and rules that I command him at Horeb for all Israel. And now we have just barely scratched the surface for all that the Old Testament says about the law. But the law is good. So what in the world is Paul talking about in Romans chapter 7, in our passage today? What is he saying about the law? Here's what he's not saying. He's not saying that the law doesn't matter. A lot of people will come to a passage like this and say, I'm a New Testament believer. Paul says, I'm dead to the law. It doesn't matter what God says in the Old Testament about his law. But look what Paul says in this same chapter, just in verse 12. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. So we know that Paul believes that the law matters. He's not saying it doesn't matter. But I want us to really look at what he's saying in verses 1 through 6. And so we've kind of been bouncing all over the place, looking at the New Testament, different, or the Old Testament, different passages. But now I want to spend time, and I just want to reread our passage. And so this is Romans 7, starting in verse 1. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we are Living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What Paul is doing here is he's describing two relationships believers have to the law. And he's going to kind of go back and forth between our former life and our present life. And we'll see this especially in verses four through six. And so while I certainly believe that scripture is divinely inspired, all the words, I also believe that the order is inspired as well. But to help us understand this passage, I want to look at our former life first, and then I want to look at our present life. And so when I'm preaching over verse five, and you're thinking, he just skipped over verse 4. Don't worry. We'll get there. Just hang in there. I really believe that this is going to best serve us as we look at the two relationships that believers have to the law. And so that first relationship, you'll see it on your handout. The first relationship we have as believers to the law is that we were formerly bound by the law. Now, this isn't explicitly stated in our passage, but Paul is stating in verse 4 that you have died. And he's implying that at one point you were alive. You can't die if you weren't first alive. And so in verse 1, Paul states, Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. So the law is binding on those that are alive. We see this illustrated in the next two verses, where Paul uses the marriage between a husband and a wife to make his point. Starting in verse 2, for a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage accordingly. She will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, 
she is not an adulteress. Now, there's some debate here as to how to interpret these two verses. And some will argue that here Paul is speaking on his view of marriage and remarriage and divorce. However, I don't believe that's what's going on here. What I believe Paul is doing is he's simply saying that death ends the rule of law. The law only applies when people are alive. We see this at many weddings where people covenant together until what? Until death do us part. This is because the law has no jurisdiction where someone has died. If you have someone guilty of a crime and they are alive, then you charge them with that crime. But no one is charging a dead man with a crime. And so the law is binding on those that are alive. And we, having once been alive, were bound to the law. But what does that mean? What does it mean to have been bound by the law? It means that the law bore a ministry of death. It means that all the law did was multiply transgressions. It exposed sin. It handed out a guilty verdict. And so those under the law or bound by the law are those that are guilty under the verdict of the law, the verdict of death, because no one can keep the law. And so to be bound by the law is to be enslaved to it and to be in chains to that which the law produces, a guilty verdict before the Lord. You see, you can't be justified before the Lord by the law. It cannot save you. The law has never been and never will be a way to salvation. Many of you know Martin Luther. Martin Luther is famous for uh, nailing the 95 Thesis to a church door, thus sparking the Protestant Reformation. Prior to this, though, Luther spent years of his life as a monk in a monastery. And here Luther was known for the regular discipline of confession where many would spend just a few minutes confessing sin, Luther would spend hours and hours and hours confessing sin, sometimes up to six hours confessing sin. In fact, he earned the name Goldbricker as his confession would at times cause him to neglect other chores and responsibilities that he had. And so why was Luther confessing sin all the time? Because as he walked through life, he saw the enormity of his own sins and his inability to satisfy a righteous God. The amount of time he spent confessing went so far as to cause him physical pain. And it got to the point where he was developing digestive difficulties due to the anxiety caused by his battling sin. You see, this is a man that's bound by the law. He's guilty. He can't change that. He's under the law, which bears the ministry of death. And it's not that as believers we don't confess sin. We do. But there's a difference. And the difference is that our sin is forgiven. Whereas the law cannot forgive sin. And so even if unbelievers aren't confessing sin like Luther, the point is that all unbelievers are bound by the law. And so for us as believers, this was an aspect of our former life. Now, a second aspect of our former life is that the law aroused sinful passions within us. The law aroused sinful passions within us. Look with me at verse 5. For while you were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. What verse 5 is talking about here is doing things specifically when you're told not to do them. And, and this is an idea that we can all relate to, right? Even as Believers, this is something we struggle with, but especially as non-believers, when we're told to not do something, there is something in you that kind of makes you want to do it. Why is that? Have you ever thought about why that is? John Piper, speaking on this verse, has this to say, and I think this is really helpful. He says, now think about this with me. The essence of our sinful condition before our conversion, before we die with Christ and receive the Holy Spirit, is not that we break specific laws. The essence of our condition is that we are hostile to God. 
And so we do not and cannot submit to God's will, God's law. The essence of our sinful condition is the unwillingness to be told what to do. The essence of sin is a passion for self-rule. We will decide for ourselves where joy is to be found. We will not admit any final decisive power or authority above self. In short, the essence of sin is self-deification, the passion to be our own God. That is what it means to be in the flesh. And so sin is not first law breaking, it is first law hating. And even before that, it is self-rule loving. Being in the flesh means we will not be told what to do. We will be our own God. What Piper is getting at here is the idea of self-rule. That as sinners, the highest authority you appeal to is yourself. No one is going to tell me what to do. And so every decision then is made through a a funnel that says, what's going to benefit me most here? And this is what we did when we were ruled by our flesh. Verse 5 states, our sinful passions were aroused by the law. But the second half of this verse states that our sinful passions were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. And if you look on your handout, you'll see that is our third and final point under our former life in which we were bound by the law. And it is that the law binds its members to bear fruit for death. This is an idea that's that's really closely tied to our last point. But where we focused on the why does the law arouse sin, I now want to spend time talking about the what happens when the law does arouse sin. And what Paul says happens is we bore fruit for death. So when the law comes to us as unbelievers, it doesn't produce the fruit for God that Paul is talking about in verse 4, but rather it produces fruit for death. And so we have a good law that comes to us as unbelievers, and all it does is produce death. Paul, in fact, makes this point in the previous chapter when he says, for the wages of sin is death. And so the punishment for our sin is death, and under the law, that's what we deserve. For us as believers, this was our fate formerly. You were bound by the law as it exposed your sin, magnified your sin, declared you guilty, and offered you no way of salvation from the impending wrath of God. You in your flesh bore fruit for death. In other words, you continued in your sin, unable to serve God as you were enslaved to your sin. Sin was your master, and the law offered you no way out. Now picture the most law-abiding Biggest rule follower you know. Maybe that's you. That individual is going to fail and won't be able to save themselves. That individual deserves death. And so Paul is making the contrast between our former life and our life now. He's saying that if we are going to bear fruit for God, as we see at the end of verse 4, if we are going to be saved from and set free from our sin, then we must die to the law. You can't just muster up the strength and willpower to obey it better, but you must die to it. You have to die to it so that in order, you might be no longer bound to it, but bound to another. And so this is what Paul is illustrating in verses 2 and 3 when he's talking about marriage. He's saying death ends the rule of law. And then guess what? For you, you as a believer, your second relationship to the law, and you'll see it on your handout, it's that as believers, we have died to the law. And church, this is such good news. The law no longer binds you. You are freed from the dominion, the curse, and the burden of the law. Look there with me in verse 4. Likewise, my brothers. And so again, this is for believers. Paul is using this to address members of God's family. And what does he say? You also have died to the law. And so looking at our illustration in verses 2 and 3, Paul is saying a death has taken place and this frees you to marry another. Where the law was once binding on you, it is no longer. But how does this happen? How do we die to the law and thus be set free from the law? Read it right here. Through the body of Christ. We die to the law through the body of Christ. So the law demands death. 
We've just walked through how the law hands out death penalties. And that doesn't just go away as a believer. There's a great misunderstanding for many people in the church that when you become a believer, when God rips you from the claws of death, that your sin doesn't deserve or receive God's wrath. Church, hear this. God does not just withhold his wrath from your sin. No, there is still a death that has to take place. His wrath must be poured out. The only difference is that for the believer, Jesus died for you. Jesus took all the wrath from God for you, for all of your sin. And we are united to him in his death. So Christ took the punishment we deserve by dying in our place and by our being united to him in his death, we are now dead to the law. This is the reality for everyone that has ever lived that someone has to die. It's either gonna be you or it's gonna be Jesus. And for us as believers, it was Jesus. That's one of the reasons we get up every week after the sermon and we come to the table and we take some cracker and we take some juice. Yet one of the saddest things is how flippant some of us are as believers with these elements. We walk up each week and we take the cracker and the juice and we come back to our seats, sometimes more excited to take off our mask than we are that Jesus died 2,000 years ago and took the wrath of God for us. That in spite of our sin and what we deserve, God in heaven said, you are mine not because of anything we did or can do, but only through the body of Christ. And so I want to implore you as believers to never let this reality go in one ear and out the other. May it never be that hearing of Jesus' death becomes mundane to you. We hear it all the time as believers, not just on Sundays, but in conversations and on the radio and when we're driving and in our DCs. But let this statement that Jesus died fall on your ears afresh this morning. When you come up to take the Lord's Supper after this sermon, may the reality of what you're proclaiming ring ever true. May you not take lightly what it means to sing these lyrics from the song, This the Power of the Cross. The lyrics read, Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day. Christ on the road to Calvary. Tried by sinful men, torn and beaten, then nailed to a cross of wood. This the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us. Took the blame, bore the wrath. We stand forgiven at the cross. And then later on in the song, this the power of the cross, son of God slain for us. What a love, what a cost. We stand forgiven at the cross. Church, you did not save yourself. You can't save yourself. It is only through Jesus that we died to the law. Not just though that we died. Jesus died to the law but he was also raised from the dead. Our Savior conquered death and rose from the dead. The one that died for us demonstrated through his resurrection that he has defeated death. And so he is alive, and thus we now in our being united to him are raised with him that we may serve him as our new master. Yet we are responsible for none of this. Church, it is only through the body of Christ that we are saved from the death penalty we are given by the law. If you find yourself here this morning and you are trusting in anything other than Jesus for your salvation, the Bible says you will not be saved. If you are standing before God and he were to ask you, why should I let you into my kingdom? The only acceptable answer is through Jesus and him alone. So if your answer has anything to do with hoping that you've been good enough 
or anything to do with what you've done, then what you are trusting in for your salvation will not save you. You cannot save yourself. Paul makes this abundantly clear in our passage today. How did we die to the law? Through the body of Christ. We keep reading in verse 4, and we read that we died to the law through the body of Christ. Why? So that we might belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead. You'll see this on your handout. We died to the law so that we might belong to him. I've titled this sermon, Dead to the Law, because that is our present relationship to it. And it's a glorious truth that we no longer sit under the condemnation of the law. Like, that's amazing. Many, in preaching this passage, have titled their sermon, Our Remarriage to Christ. And that's a fine title, because it really captures the idea of the illustration in verses 2 and 3, that because a death has taken place, we are now free to remarry, and the remarriage that takes place is our remarriage to Christ. We haven't just died and been set free from the law, but we now belong to Christ. And so Paul is writing here in our passage, you were formerly bound by the law, but praise God because we are now dead to the law. And here's the implication of that, that you belong to Christ. Church, if you take nothing else away from this sermon, if you take nothing else away from this passage, I pray that you get this. I pray that in your understanding of the fact that you have died to the law, that you recognize that you belong to Christ. Last week in talking about our sin, John mentioned that sometimes it can be helpful to literally tell your sin that it is no longer your master. Why? Because you now have a new master, and his name is Jesus So where formerly you served your own passions, you now serve Jesus. Why? Because you belong to him. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, For you were bought with a price. In other words, you are not your own. The idea is littered all throughout the New Testament, and it's found right here in our passage today. It's the idea of Christ's lordship. And the lordship of Christ is really vital to the gospel message in that Jesus is both Savior and Lord. A lot of people today want to act like Jesus can just be Savior, but not be Lord of their life. If Jesus isn't Lord of your life, then he hasn't saved you. These ideas are inseparable from one another. Christianity is not simply adding Jesus to your life. Instead, it is a devoting of yourself completely to him, submitting to please him above all else. It demands a dying to yourself and a following of your new master. And we talked earlier about the law arousing sinful passions within us. And the reason for that being we were once our own gods. No one could tell us what to do. Well, now you have someone telling you what to do. And this is going to rub a lot of people wrong. We are so sin sick in this world that the idea of submitting to another, of someone else telling me what to do, is really uncomfortable. But we must remember that, firstly, we are created and not creator. Meaning we don't get to determine what it is that we should and shouldn't do. Secondly, To obey God is to do what you were created to do. You were created for his glory. This is the idea of Christian hedonism, that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. So yes, due to our sin nature, obedience can be really hard. But there is also so much joy found in obeying the one to whom you belong. So when you leave here and someone says something to you that irritates you before you respond, ask yourself, to whom do I belong? When your spouse is a jerk, before you respond, ask yourself, to whom do I belong? 
When your kids are not behaving, before you respond, ask yourself, to whom do I belong? When you are stressed and there's temptation to run to drugs or alcohol, ask yourself, to whom do I belong? When you're thinking of serving in this way or that, just so that people will notice you, ask yourself, to whom do I belong? When you're exaggerating a story or just twisting the truth to paint yourself in a better light, ask yourself, to whom do I belong? When you're alone and you're tempted to click on that link or you're tempted to look at that image, ask yourself, to whom do I belong? When you're spending all your money on food and entertainment, ask yourself, to whom do I belong? When you want to post that comment on social media, ask yourself, to whom do I belong? When you're tempted towards homosexual relationships, ask yourself, to whom do I belong? When you're tempted to gossip about whoever because you're just ticked off at them, ask yourself, to whom do I belong? When you go to vote this Tuesday, ask yourself, to whom do I belong? To whom do you belong? You belong to Jesus. You belong to Jesus. You don't belong to yourself. You don't belong to a political party. You don't belong to any other thing or anyone. You belong to Jesus. Church, you have to remember this. This is such a rich truth that we find in verse 4, that we belong to him who has been raised from the dead so that in our being united to him, we might be raised to new life. No longer bound by the law. We have died to the law. We keep reading in verse 4. So that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. And so this is the last point on your handout. We died to the law so that we might bear fruit for God. And this is really important. Jump with me down to verse 6. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. How are believers to bear fruit for God? It's by the Holy Spirit in you. You see, you've been made new, and the Holy Spirit is now your help. A lot of people have completely twisted passages like this to say that we have died to the law. I don't have to keep the law. And the first thing is just read Romans 6. Like if you've been with us for the past two weeks, you don't have a license to just sin rampantly. But the second thing is that you've completely misunderstood what it means to have died to the law. To be dead to the law is just to say that you've been delivered from the penalty of the law, from the punishment of the law, from the guilty verdict that the law hands out. The law can't justify you. The law can't save you. And so to be dead to the law isn't to be free from any responsibility to obedience. It's so that you might then walk in obedience. So that we might bear fruit for God. But that doesn't happen until we have been set free from the law and given the Holy Spirit. And this is a really big thing. That the the prophets in the Old Testament, they anticipated this for a long time. That one day God would change us from the inside out. We see this in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove your heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. You see, the law was never meant to do this and couldn't do it. So now we serve in the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Christian, Jesus has saved you because nothing else could ever possibly save you. And having saved you, he has called you to himself that you might belong to no other except to him and him alone. So now go and bear fruit for him, knowing that you need his help, you need his spirit. And his spirit within you is powerful. We often talk about and we feel the power of sin in our own life, but there's a greater power. And that power is the Holy Spirit. You can put to death your sin and walk in holiness. You can say no to sin. You can bear fruit for God. Your sin is real, but the power of Jesus is more real. 
But what good is the law then? How are we as Christians, now dead to the law, supposed to think through our relationship to the law? Here's how the law is helpful. The law can be really helpful as a means to test yourself. Are you knowing and loving and trusting in Christ as you are? And for some of you, the law very well might reveal that you do not belong to Christ. And so praise God that the law reveals that. And the appropriate response is to now repent and trust in Jesus. But for many believers, you look at the law and you think, I belong to him. I'm a Christian. I think I'm doing enough. I'm good. But church, hear this. It's not about you. Jesus Christ deserves all the honor, all the glory, all the praise. He did everything when you could do nothing. And so we're not looking for the bare minimum here. He called you to belong to him. Every nook and cranny, every aspect of your life, it's his. You owe it all to him. This doesn't save you, but it's who you are. You're an image bearer, a son, a daughter, a slave to a new master. We're not looking for passing grades here. We're looking for all of the ways in which we can serve him and honor him and glorify him. Because Every part of you and every aspect of your life belongs to him. And so now when you look at the law, you will see the character of God. And as believers, you will do well to know his character in order that you might please him and bear fruit for him. So in light of understanding our relationship to the law, that formerly we were bound to the law, and now we are dead to the law, I want to get really practical. And so first off, if you have not turned from your sins and trusted in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, I want to urge you to do that even right now. I want to implore you to believe the gospel that the reigning God of the universe eternally saves and satisfies believing sinners when they repent and believe in him. For us as believers, though, I want to give you two quick points. And this isn't found directly in our passage. But if we're to live out the truths of this passage, then I really believe these are immensely helpful. And so number one is just to get in the word each day. I think it's best that this happens in the morning, that you wake up every day and remind yourself of your neediness and your weakness. That more than anything, you need to get before the Lord to make it through your day. I do understand that some of you work weird hours and that it's difficult for you in the morning. My wife worked night shift, so I get that. I understand what it's like to sleep weird hours, but the point is this, that if we as believers belong to Jesus and we are his, then you have to know what it looks like to follow him, to love him, to obey him. And even for what you know, we are forgetful people. And so get in the word each day to remind yourself of what is true and how it is that you should live. The second point is this. It's to find people to hold you accountable. We are not meant to walk through life alone. We need people that can lovingly come to us and say hard things when we are failing to live out what it looks like to bear fruit for God. And so that means two things. It means first that we have to invite that, that there is a space and a context for that to take place. You have to allow others to speak in. But the second thing is that you have to hold other people accountable. We can't all sit here and expect everyone else to just serve us and hold us accountable. We have to be willing to do that for one another. This is part of what it means to be a healthy member This is part of what it looks like to bear one another's burdens. I meet with a group of guys every Friday morning where we confess sin, we remind each other of truth, we encourage one another, and we pray for each other. And we have a group text where all throughout the week we're checking in and we're talking about how we're doing. 
And man, I need that. I have been so immensely blessed by having faithful brothers to walk through life with and to hold me accountable. Just two days ago, this past Friday, I had men helping me to see the ways in which I have loved myself and failed to love my wife, how ultimately I failed to love my Savior. I was forgetting who I was belonging, who I belong to. And so if you don't have that, if you don't have people in your life who know you and can call out sin in your life, I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you to really seek out those types of relationships. And our DCs are a great place to start for that. But this is so important to find. And so I pray that each of you are able to have that in order that we might live out the truths of this passage. I pray that we are a church of people that are dead to the law, yet marked as a people who bear fruit for God. A people who remember that we belong to Christ. Let's pray. Father, what a joy it is to gather each week to remind ourselves of truth. What a joy it is to be a people who are dead to the law. We thank you that we are no longer bound by it, no longer under its punishment of death. But now we belong to Jesus. What a joy it is to know that you sent your son to live the life we couldn't, to fulfill the law in not only his life but in his death by dying the death that we deserve. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us as your people by your spirit to bear fruit for you. I pray that you would help us to be obedient sons and daughters. I pray that we would be a people marked by holiness and righteous living. Father, I know how easy it can be to leave here on a Sunday morning, to go out having been taught by your word and to feel like we got this. Father, may we be vigilant in our fight not just to forget it by tomorrow or to forget it even by Friday. But Father, may we be vigilant Sunday through Sunday that we might walk in obedience to your word. This is not an easy task. We need your help, so please help us. We love you and we pray this and ask this in Jesus' name, amen.